Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Listenby. I'm one of DA Krasner's first assistants. On behalf of District Attorney Larry Krasner and in recognition of Women's History Month, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the release of the Girls Report. This report is entitled Overlooked or Overscrutinized. It analyzes the experiences and outcomes of all girls arrested and charged within Philadelphia's juvenile courts in 2019. These girls comprise a minority of all system-involved youth in Philadelphia, only 19%, consistent with national trends where girls are up to 31% of system-involved youth. The Girls Report is the culmination of a year-long research project by staff and consultants with the District Attorney's Office, <laughs> utilizing the data generated in 2019. For many years, there's been a lack of adequate resources and programming for girls who entered the system in Philadelphia, along with stark racial disparities. There are three important goals for our convening today. First, the Girls Report focuses on the reimagining of, more, of a more equitable and fair youth justice system in Philadelphia by laying the foundation to establish a plan to better serve girls. Second, we are hopeful that in the process of improving the Philadelphia juvenile justice system for girls, community leaders, activists, local and state government officials, including the courts, the Department of Human Services, and the Philadelphia Police Department and the District Attorney's Office, will learn lessons that can eventually improve the system for boys. And finally, it is our hope that the new case management system developed to collect data in the DA's office will help lay the foundation for further collaboration and cooperation by all parties to actively and aggressively, and I repeat, aggressively improve this system. The opening phase of this event will consist of remarks by District Attorney Larry Krasner, Chief Defender Keisha Husson, Chief Legal Officer for the Juvenile Law Center, Marsha Levick, and the former Deputy Commissioner for, Juvenile, for uh, the Department of Human Services, Juvenile Justice Services Division, Tamin Farlow. Finding, following these remarks, we'll have a brief presentation about the girls' report from its co-authors, Adam Serlin, who is the founder and principal of Independent Variable LLC, and Keir Sheeran, the Youth Justice Policy Analyst from the District Attorney's Office. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you the District Attorney of Philadelphia County, Larry Krasner. Uh, when Larry asked me to come work for him, he made it absolutely clear that one of his top priorities was improving the juvenile justice system for youth. As he said, kids should be treated like kids in the system. To the extent possible, we need to keep kids in the juvenile justice system, not in the adult system. What that means is whenever possible, with direct file juveniles, and even in some cases, uh, children charged with more serious offenses who are 12, 13, or even 10 years old, the goal is to try and get juvenile justice treatment so they can be rehabilitated in the system, and if necessary, sometimes a dual jurisdiction uh, outcome. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Larry Krasner. So I'm going to try to help out by not saying a whole lot. Um, but I do want to say this. I'm delighted that we have so many people in the room who do such incredibly important work with juveniles and also especially with girls in the system. Before I comment on this report, which we are, we've made some efforts to release this month because uh, this is a month when we celebrate women's history, I also want to give an acknowledgment to my other first assistant, at the DA's office, Carolyn Engel Temin. For those of you who do not know, she's been a pioneer in the criminal justice system. This was the first woman public defender in the city of Philadelphia in a younger era. She was also a homicide prosecutor uh, under, I believe, Arlen Specter and Ed Rendell. She was a judge on the Court of Common Pleas for close to 30 years, uh, and then went to do international human rights judging at The Hague before she returned to do work here. I think um, we should all acknowledge the tremendous contribution she has made to girls, to women, and that she continues to make every day. <laughs> A couple more acknowledgments. I want to acknowledge Adam Serlin and Kira Sheeran, who are the authors of this report, and you'll hear from them soon enough. Uh, the report itself will be available at phillyda.org very shortly. You can download it there or you can take a look at it there. I also want to acknowledge DAO Juvenile Justice Supervisor Patricia McKinney, who is now here 
We have uh, ADA Jordan King, who runs our juvenile diversion program, and many other ADAs and staff who work closely in the juvenile system, some of them experience that goes back four decades. I want to acknowledge the youth justice practitioners and leaders from more than two dozen organizations, uh, including from Family Court, DHS, City Government, School District of Philadelphia, Youth Justice Activists, Philadelphia Student Union, and Diversion Program partner organizations that are here. Now, having said all that good stuff, um, there's a lot more I could say that's in the report, but I think the best use of this time is actually to say this. Girls are without question in a unique position in the juvenile justice system. They are arrested in small numbers, and they are arrested for very different kinds of offenses. The title of the report itself suggests what the problem is, which is that they are overlooked and simultaneously over-scrutinized in ways that are going to be explained to you. Uh, we have done this report in a spirit of transparency. It's not the only one that we're going to be doing in the next couple months. Look for two more. We understand that this report is not for us to edit at the DA's office. It is not for us to change at the DA's office. We have to provide a space where experts in the field, where independent people can come in with independent funding to write their own reports, even if those reports find problems, even if those reports point back at us, even if those reports point at some of the people in the room. We have to have that kind of a discussion or we're not going to be able to get anywhere. So I hope you will understand there will be problems laid out here. This is not a blame game. The, the problems are being laid out. So after the first hour, when we do the breakout sessions, all the people who are in here with the expertise that they have can talk about what the solutions may be and what the steps forward, what the path forward may be in that regard. Um, in my mind, that's the only way we're ever going to get anything done. I know that my organization makes mistakes every single day. We don't intend to quit. We intend to keep making mistakes because that is the nature of working in a system as imperfect as ours where we are forced to try to address things with resources that are inadequate and where we do that about 35,000 times a year. That's the nature of it. But I hope that this will be an opportunity for everyone who's attending here to, to reflect on what could be good steps forward and how we could try to come to a better space as we admit the problems that exist. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce um, my favorite chief defender. And I'm not kidding. I think, I think that um, Keisha Hudson is doing a tremendous job at the Public Defender's Office. My favorite chief defender, Chief Defender Hudson. I have to talk to Larry about that uh, description there of his being the favorite chief defender. Um, just want to acknowledge, um, uh, before I, I get into my formal remarks, um, the action um, that's taking place outside. Um, I see also community groups, um, members of our participatory defense hubs, the Haddington hubs are present here today, that this is an issue that is so important to the community. They are so passionate and fired up about this crisis. Um, and acknowledge that the narrative that we are reading in the media um, about uh, crime, about gun violence, um, is, is it's having an impact um, in our justice system in terms of over-policing the kids that we're seeing coming into the system in our, from our schools. Um, and the community is really, uh, really organized and passionate and ready for change. Um, and so I want to thank District Attorney Krasner and his team um, for um, the work that they've done um, putting together this, uh, this report. Um, it is an important report. We are seeing um, more girls come into the system. We're seeing black girls come into the system. Um, I think black girls are not only overlooked or over-scrutinized, um, they are um, over-policed. Over um, they are perceived as more mature. They are perceived as more aggressive. They're perceived as uh, adults um, in our schools, um, in our, in our uh, justice system, and they're treated that way. Um, so I think this is an important uh, first step. Um, while boys make up the majority of youth in our system, um, the number of girls is growing at a rate that should concern us all. Um, anyone who has heard me or my team speak on the issue of youth justice knows that the Defender uh, it has a keen focus on social interventions. As a society, we owe it to our children to do everything we can to keep them out of the justice system and to provide direct, 
family-centered interventions to those who do become justice involved. The data in the report um, underscores the need for our system to be much more comprehensive and thoughtful in its approach to our youth and includes taking um, more care in considering which uh, young people are being sentenced to placement in these facilities, ensuring that if we have to place and we should do everything in our power to avoid that, um, that these facilities are close to home and easily accessible to family members, to be thoughtful um, and selective about detaining children with pending charges or other alleged infractions, um, and most importantly, increasing the number of partnerships we have with the city's community-based organizations uh, so we can connect young people and their families with the support services uh, they need. The report's uh, recommendation to increase budgets for preventative and uh, supportive community services absolutely resonates with our office. Uh, we are currently working on expanding our ability uh, to provide social services uh, to our clients, to our youth clients, um, and it is budget season, uh, and I will note we are asking for $10 million, um, and a, a significant portion of that ask is geared towards um, increasing and expanding our child advocacy unit. Our data is strong and shows that involvement in the child welfare system um, and Philadelphia leads the nation in the placement of black and brown youth in our dependency system. And that involvement leads to um, involvement in the delinquency system and in our adult system. One in three of our kids in the delinquency system have a dependency uh, involvement. And so when we disrupt black and brown families and we separate children from their families, that has life long consequences. So while the focus is on the delinquency system here today, we have to go all the way back um, and, and we need serious reform of our child welfare system. Um, in the meantime, uh, we will continue to work um, with, uh, collaboratively with partners with the DAO. We are um, very close to securing funding to be able to do pre-petition diversion work and restorative justice work. Um, and uh, we will continue to always be a uh, passionate partner um, for anyone willing to, to look at um, and keep our young girls and our boys away from the system. Thank you. At this, at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the Chief Legal Officer for the Juvenile Law Center, Ms. Marsha Levick. Marsha uh, is co-founder of the Juvenile Law Center back in 1975, and she's had a very active legal career partnering with many of the organizations here uh, at this presentment, and also working on some of the seminal uh, cases before the United States Supreme Court. She's been involved in writing briefs, amicus briefs and appellate briefs for Roper v. Simmons, Graham v. Miller, JDB, uh, and finally uh, the case that that uh, transformed the way we handle juvenile lifers uh, um, and making it retroactive. So Marsha, without any further ado, would you please come and join us and provide us with remarks. Hello. Thank you, Bob. District Attorney Krasner for including me in this event. I want to acknowledge Adam and Sierra, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, for your work in producing this report. It's a pretty remarkable document. Um, I think you're the main event, so I'm just going to say a few things. Um, I essentially have three things that I want to address. First of all, I want to state that 20 years ago, I published a law journal article on girls in the juvenile justice system. And it is dismaying to note that the statistics that we identified in that report the circumstances which brought girls into the juvenile justice system, which is the report identifies are distinct, frankly, for girls, um, are exactly the same that you are going to read about and hear about today. Um, things haven't changed. And in writing that article 20 years ago, my colleague, Fran Sherman, um, and I had a very specific goal. And that was actually to apply an equity lens to girls in the justice system. And what I mean by that is not an equal rights lens. And I think that that's what's so important about issuing this report that is specifically looking at the plight of girls in the justice system. It's not enough to just give everybody the same. What we have learned over time, over and over again, is that when we think about the involvement 
and the interaction of girls with the justice system that they have very specific needs. And we can't assume that what works for boys will work for girls. We can't assume that if we paint the programs pink, it will work for girls. And we really have to develop uh, programs, responses, initiatives, and resources that are very specifically designed to ensure them equitable and ultimately equal opportunities to develop, to mature, to get through um, their adolescent years in productive ways and in positive ways. But that requires, as I said, I think actually looking at girls as girls, as young women, and I acknowledge and I appreciate in the report the length you went to to talk about the use of language, and we're using girls today, but we understand the term is broader. Um, but also to just be really sensitive to the fact that this does require a very specific lens in how we think about girls in the system. Like Keisha, I also want to acknowledge the young people um, who many of you passed through or interacted with or said hello to when you came into the building today. Um, they're protesting downstairs because they have had experiences in the juvenile justice system that haven't worked for them, that have been painful, that have been contrary to the kinds of recommendations that we see in the report today. And I think that as District Attorney Krasner acknowledged, and I think that's also why they're here, you don't always get it right. And the office has certainly, I think they came into uh, leadership with a lot of um, high hopes and promises. Some of them haven't been kept. Uh, and it's important to continue to hear from these young people, to hear their voices, and to pay attention to what they say and to what their experiences have been. And my last comment is just this, and one that none of you will be surprised about. I have been in this space, as you've heard, since 1975. Um, that means that I have seen a lot of reports <laughs> come and go. And the painful part of reading a report like this, which has not only, frankly, many groundbreaking recommendations, I would say some fantastical <laughs> recommendations in the literal sense of that term, um, is what happens tomorrow. That's really all that matters, what happens tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And I really hope that this, this is an opportunity. Every report is an opportunity. May this one matter. May we pay attention. And I also hope, um, I know the report was based on Philly data. As I said, this, this is the same data that I was looking at nationally 20 years ago. I know this data is reflective of what's going on around the country. Although we may have 50 different juvenile justice systems, they all need to address the needs of girls, the very specific needs of girls in that system. And I hope that as you push this out in Philadelphia, let's push it out across the country, because I think these recommendations need to be heard everywhere. Thank you. And our final speaker before we begin taking a close look at the report is Ms. Tameen Farlow. We're really fortunate to have her join us here today because she has seen the system from inside out for more than 20 years. Ms. Farlow is the former Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Human Services Juvenile Justice uh, Division. She was very actively involved in promoting reform of the system years and years ago while she was still uh, in her position there. At this time, I'd like her to come forward and provide her perspective, perspective on these issues. Thank you. Hi, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much, D.A. Krasner and Bob and Adam and Sarah for the wonderful report. Um, there's so much in there. I hope that you all will take the time to read it in depth when you have the opportunity. Um, you know, this issue around girls is not a new issue. Uh, someone's already said it, but for many years we've surfaced this issue of girls and how is it their needs are met or have been failed to have been met in our system. Um, you know, enough is enough. Our girls matter. Um, and so as I think about girls, I certainly consider myself, who was once a girl, right? <laughs> uh, but you know, my situation is a little bit different, and I'll just share this very briefly. Um, I was raised in the Richard Allen Housing Project, which isn't very far from here, and it wasn't the beautiful townhouses that you now see. It was the real projects. And so I was raised there. And by the time I was 13 years old, I was pregnant. I had my daughter when I was 14 years old. I was an eighth grader at Penn Treaty Junior High School. And in spite of those beginnings, with the help and support of a mother whose love was unfailing. I survived that, got through high school, went on to LaSalle University, and graduated from Temple University with a master's degree. And the story goes on. You know what the rest of it turns out to be. So I say that to say 
that girls can make it in spite of the difficulties that many of them have endured, in spite of the traumas that many of them have endured. All of us in this space have a responsibility for supporting that girl through to a healthy life. And she can make it, but she won't make it with the policies and practices as they currently exist. She'll only make it if we change. And so individually, when we meet in separate groups and we talk about those things, we've got to be honest with ourselves about what has worked and what hasn't worked. And a lot of what we've done, someone talked about simply painting the rooms pink. Girls don't belong in secure confinement when their offenses are low hanging. That's not the appropriate response. We wouldn't give chemotherapy to someone who simply had a headache. And so why would we over medicate, over treat a young person who has come to the attention of our system having low risks but high needs. Let's give the girl what she needs in terms of those services and make sure that they're gender responsive, that they're delivered by people who really give a hoot, right? Because how many times have we handed our girls off to institutions and facilities and programs where people are simply there to make a good buck because it sounds good to say that they have a girls program. True gender responsive programming really meets the unique needs of girls and ensures that those girls leave those placements, those programs, those services healthier, stronger, more empowered, and more ready to participate in the world in meaningful ways. And so as we go on today and we have our different breakout groups, I hope that you all will be honest with yourselves about what your, either your individual programs have done and be honest to say that that really hasn't worked. You know, what's striking to me about how we measure success, at least here in Philadelphia as I've seen it, is we talk to the provider of that service, right, who has a vested interest in appearing that they've done a real good job. So you ask them, how have you done? And they say, I've done well. But you know, the real test of efficacy is not when you're there holding the kid's hand, it's what happens when you let go. And so to the degree that we can assess girls beyond the time that they're in the program and follow them out and make sure that they get the same kinds of interventions that we give on the child welfare side, you know, it's stark to me that when we talk about child welfare, we talk about safety, permanency, and well-being. Don't children in the juvenile justice system deserve that as well? And yet it's not even on the table, it's all about other services, but safety, safety within institutions, safety in their communities. Girls deserve that. They deserve safety when they're at home. They deserve that permanency. Don't girls deserve outcomes that ensure that they have lifelong partners, people with whom they can live and enjoy the rest of their lives, and yet our current system doesn't do that. So this really is going to require some deep thinking on all of our parts to make sure that the policies and practices that exist within our institutions, whether they be private or public, are such that they push girls on to healthy and bright futures. I look forward to today's conversations and I hope that I will get an opportunity to engage with some of you as well a little later on. Thank you very much, Tamine, for those en enlightening remarks. Um, I would now like to introduce to you the two co-authors of the report. First, Adam Serlin. Uh, Adam uh, came to the district attorney's office uh, a little over five years ago, and he had this uh, wild idea about maybe we should be able to develop our own case management system and have it tailored to the unique needs of a prosecutor's office. We talked about it extensively. Uh, we were able to get funding for uh, his initial work from the Stonely Foundation and then from other private sources. Uh, Adam is a person who works tirelessly uh, to pursue a particular goal. When I say tirelessly, um, I would often get calls uh, from Adam at 10 o'clock at night. He was still at the office. Or unfortunately, I would come back in the office at 8 o'clock in the morning and find that he had slept there overnight. This was not an occasional event. He did it often. And we often had to tell him to go home, please, Adam, get some rest, come back the next day. I understand how important this is to you and to all the people that you're working on behalf of, but you also have to survive the experience. So we're going to have Adam come up here momentarily. I'd also like to uh, introduce you to Kira uh, Sheeran. Kira came to us uh, as a PhD student at Temple. Uh, and she uh, has worked tirelessly alongside Adam. It's tough to work with Adam without working tirelessly, as you can probably guess. Uh, but she has been just uh, uh, exceptional. She worked first as a volunteer. Adam came to me and said, well, here's working as a volunteer. Do you think you might have a little extra money to pay for her? Fortunately, we were able to get support from the Department of Human Services to hire a juvenile justice policy analyst, and she took up the reins and has worked, really done a fantastic job since then. So without any further ado, I'll give to you the two co-authors of the report. I believe Adam's going to come up first, and we'll go forward with that. And uh, then we'll uh, have a few minutes for questions before we have breakout groups. Okay, thank you. Adam?
Thank you, Ms. Felicity. Thank you so much for everyone who has uh, spoken, a lot of my personal mentors and heroes. So I uh, really appreciate you all being here with us. And thanks to everybody in the room. Um, so what is our big plan for the day, right? First and foremost, we're not here to just talk about data, right? We are, in the beginning of this, going to raise some awareness of some issues, after which we are going to try and get into some breakout rooms and actually make some step forward on some four specific issues that we've defined as key takeaways of this report. So this is not just an exercise in releasing a report. We really wanted to call people together and try and collaborate however that looks. It's probably not going to be perfect, so bear with us, but we wanted to take a first step and then we'll come back after that and see what everybody wants to do moving forward. Um, and so background and history of the project really quick before we talk about some of the findings, right? This is part of a larger effort by the DAO to use data to both increase transparency and redesign its own policies and practices. There's very little publicly available data in the city of Philadelphia. So even though we are paying for all of these services with mostly tax dollars, it's very hard to find out how much we're paying or how they are uh, doing. And Ms. Farlow said it very well. When we do that, we're often asking the folks who are receiving the funding how we're doing. So the stuff we're looking at today, it's not necessarily very easy to just go to a website and figure out. So because of that, we had to kind of build a system and hand enter and analyze a bunch of data to kind of get this thing um, in a place where we felt that we could talk about a lot of things. Uh, this is an executive summary. Um, it, there's going to be a larger report about this that is released in five stages. Each stage is going to focus on one specific aspect of the juvenile justice system. Um, it's pretty long, so we figured we were going to release uh, an executive summary, which could be its own report, and people could read that. And then as we move forward, we can really dig in more specifically on specific issues. It's a policy-oriented report, right? It's using the most complete year of data that we had at the time we started writing. We thought it was important to not wait until we had a million years worth of data, but to get whatever we could find out into the world as quickly as possible so we could start coming up with some solutions. We're not making any claims of causality or statistical significance. What this report really is, is a case study tracking outcomes for a full year worth of you know, arrests in a city as they proceeded through the entire juvenile justice system and what happened to those youth. Uh, the unit of measurement is a youth arrest in 2019 for which the DAO filed felony or misdemeanor charges. Sorry, just some nuts and bolts so you all know what you're looking at before we get to the data. Uh, it does not include data on declinations or summary offenses. It does include data on youth who were diverted or direct filed to the adult system. The sample size that we're going to look at is 2,242 youth arrests in 2019 for which the DAO filed felony or misdemeanor charges. And we followed everything that happened to all those kids who were arrested for two full years inside of the courts. So it's going to have all court disposition data through 12-31-2022. And we were able to look at re-arrest data as of 12-31, oh, sorry. Court hearings through 12-31-2021, uh, re-arrest data is through 12-31-2022. Uh, we did not have any data available on youth who identify as non-binary or trans. And so that is a limitation of the report, but it's a limitation of the way we collect data inside of the juvenile justice system. So we're not reporting it because we didn't have it, and uh, that is something that all of us who work inside the system really need to try and move forward because we're never going to get a complete picture of this unless we get better data. So before we get into the key findings, we do want to make clear, who are we talking about when we talk about girls or youth in the juvenile justice system? Right? This was um, race and ethnicity data from 2018 report called Growing Up Philly. So this is the Philadelphia youth population in 2018. It was about 47% black, about 23% Hispanic. In our arrest data, it was about 81% black and 14% Hispanic. So it is about 95% black and brown youth who are entering the juvenile justice system. Right? We did not report this as a key finding of this report. Because if you look, this cuts very specifically at boys and girls arrests, it's exactly the same. So about 95% of kids who are entering the system are black and brown youth. So all data that we should be looking at moving forward, when we talk about the experience of girls in the juvenile justice system of Philadelphia, we are very specifically talking about black and brown girls who are going through the system. So all of our forthcoming data that you see should be interpreted through this lens. Um, we're not issuing it as a key finding, though, because this is just a reality of every arrest in the city of Philadelphia. So our key takeaways, we're going to break this down into four major themes, and uh, the breakout rooms are going to be targeted towards each of these themes. Before we do that, the framing of the report, right, specific recommendations aside, the organizing principle of our work to craft and publicize these potential solutions is to display how a targeted redesign of the juvenile justice system for girls may offer a unique 
chance for leaders to substantially downsize said system at little risk to public safety. So although there are less girls in the system, if we really look at who's proceeding through the system, it really does give us a unique chance to get a lot of kids out of the system that might not need to be there, right, if we really design something better. So we're going to go to our key findings. The first finding, or our key themes, we're calling the gender skew. This is going to have uh, less data than the other ones. It's a pretty basic idea that a largely male gender skew in the system leads to less research on girls and fewer girls' resources, right? So this happens both nationally and locally. We heard people talking about this has been a problem we've all acknowledged. Some people for 30 years, 20 years, this is not a new problem. Um, but uh, if we look first at arrests nationally, 69% of arrests uh, in 2019 based on the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention data were of boys, whereas 31% were of girls. In Philadelphia, 81% of arrests were of boys. So the system is primarily comprised of boys. That is something that we know. But what does that mean? The most practical implication of this is stakeholders across the country report often the existence of fewer programs and services for girls in the juvenile justice system. And of those programs that do exist, few are evaluated for effectiveness. And so there are more boys in the system, so resources go towards boys, as does research. We could put a bunch of stats up here, but we'll just show as we were putting this presentation together, um, there was just a report that came out last year out of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, talking about the same problem they're having, a lack of resources for girls. And we thought this quote was a good one from a chief judge there that said years and years ago, it was only young boys that committed crimes. All the resources, all the money, all the projects were put into youth boys to figure out how to stop recidivism. What we usually did was say, put them in the boys program. But girls have different needs, wants, and issues. So we've heard two people say it. Uh, we can't just paint something pink and call it a girls program, right? So most of these services have been designed primarily for boys, and then we put girls into them. There are many reasons potentially for this. We're going to do, oh, actually, before that, to talk very specifically about what we're talking about locally, that was some national stuff. As we stand here today, or as we start to write this, there are a number of programs available in the city of Philadelphia only for boys that are not available for girls. So there's a program called the Post-Adjudicatory Evening Reporting Center. This is an alternative to placement for youth struggling to comply with probation. So a last chance for kids who are about to get sent to placement to you know, get another chance in the community that is only available for boys in the city of Philadelphia is not available for girls. There's something called a community-based detention shelter. So when a youth must be detained, uh, there's a community-based shelter where they can go. It's a smaller facility run by a nonprofit or the city's, state's, uh, the city's secure detention facility. The community-based detention shelter is an alternative to secure confinement for youth held in detention that is only available for boys in the city of Philadelphia. It is not available for girls. An aftercare evening reporting center is a community-based support for youth returning home from placement that is only available to our knowledge for boys and not available for girls. And possibly the most important thing, at the writing of this report, to our knowledge, we are unaware of any non-state placement facilities available for girls in Philadelphia's juvenile justice system. So what that means, state placement is the deepest end of the system. It is the most secure. It is the most expensive. Boys have some alternatives if they're going to be sent to placement to not go to state placement. As we stand here, girls do not. So we could talk about many reasons for this. We're going to do kind of a little wonky exercise here about funding. Um, someone up here had just talked about how it works with service providers. I used to be a service provider. So I will say, if we pay people per kid per day or a per diem rate, and let's say we set that rate even for boys and girls, and I say, I'm going to pay you $10 per kid per day of the programs you serve, we could talk about the maybe perverse incentives that might give. If we go at the bottom here, this is the number of kids in your program. If we go here, this is the amount of money you would make. So let's say I run a boys program, and there are 20 boys. I'll be making $200 a day as an agency. If I open a girls program, and there's only 10 girls, I'm making $100 a day as an agency. So if we're doing a straight financial motive, right? At 15 kids, I'll be making 50 less dollars per day as an agency. At 20 kids, I'm making $100 per day less as an agency. Now, if we're serving 500 kids, 200 kids, 300 kids, this, these numbers actually expand, right? So that's if we pay per kid per day and pay equal rates. Alternately, I said that as a profit motive, if we're saying, Completely altruistically, I just want to run a program for girls. I don't care how much I get paid. However, I do need to cover $100 of fixed costs to keep my doors open, right? So I need 10 kids to break even. Anything below that, I lose real money. Anything above that, I might gain money. Let's say I open a program. 
for boys, I have 10 boys, I can keep my doors open. If there's eight girls, as an agency, I am losing $20 a day. And so you do hear people all the time say, hey, I would like to serve girls, but I struggle to keep my uh, doors open. Where that creates a perverse incentive is people say, well, oh, that mean we need girls, more girls in the system. We don't actually want more girls to be arrested and we do need that resource, right? But uh, there's some different stuff we might be able to do with funding mechanisms to do away with that funding mechanism and still get these girls services. So our recommendations here, there's many more in the report. And I'm gonna pass it to Kira for the next section. We believe we need to examine the relationship between existing funding mechanisms and the availability of girls programming and explore innovative and funding innovative funding alternatives. So apologies, some of these are very wonky solutions, but we do think if we really, we really drill down on how we pay for services, that will make a big difference in a lot of places. We think that juvenile justice outcome needs to be tied to outcome-based metrics that consider the intersectional identities of youth receiving juvenile justice services. So we heard someone say that often we ask service providers how they're doing and that's how we get our data. If we're giving money, we should figure out uh, what outcomes we want in order to make sure we're getting the best outcomes for children. And we need to examine those outcomes by you know, all types of different identities. And we do think we need to implement gender specific curriculum practices for juvenile justice programming and services. Again, we can't just take a boys program and paint it pink. If we're gonna see later, girls have a whole ton of different needs. We need to acknowledge that in the design of our programs. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Kira who will share the next two of our findings. All right, thank you, Adam. So our second key takeaway, as Adam discussed, there's a clear gender skew in the system. So we wanted to take a look at what is driving girls' entry into the system to see if it's different from boys. And so one of our key takeaways that is available in the report is that assaults are a primary driver of girls' entry into the juvenile justice system. So to take a closer look at that, we want to look at the offense skew. So for this data, we did not disaggregate by like charge grades, such as felony, misdemeanor, um, and grades within those categories. Instead, we're just going to look at a skew of behavioral categories that kids enter the system for. And so first, we're going to take a look at boys. And you can see their charge categories are fairly evenly dispersed across a number of behaviors with their largest category being for robbery at about 21% of boys' arrests. If we take a look at girls, we can see it is much less evenly skewed across these behaviors, and specifically, we want to highlight assaults. So you can see that about 44% of girls who were arrested and charged in Philadelphia were charged with an assault. And this is more than double boys' highest rate, which was 21% for robbery. This is 44%. So we're talking about almost half of girls here who are entering the system for um, an accusation of assault. But, of course, we also want to disaggregate by what those charge grades are, if we're looking at misdemeanors, simple assaults, felony, aggravated assaults, and so forth. And so if we look at girls' top 10 leading um, charges, the top three are all assaults. And so taking a closer look at this, we specifically want to highlight that lead charge, that number one lead charge of an F2 aggravated assault and talk a little bit more about what goes into charging decisions and what that looks like from the standpoint of the Pennsylvania Criminal Code. And so some important facts about an F2 assault in Pennsylvania. For one, the Pennsylvania Criminal Code mandates that all assaults against a member of a protected class are charged as an F2 aggravated assault. And this is regardless of intent or injury from that assault. And so in Pennsylvania, teachers and other school staff, including school resource officers, are considered a member of this protected class. So if you have a student who pushes a teacher or a school resource officer, even if it doesn't cause injury, if the office receives this arrest, they have to charge it as an F2 aggravated assault due to the protected class mandate in the Pennsylvania Criminal Code. And so we took a closer look at what girls are being charged for for these F2 aggravated assaults and found that about 64% of our F2 charges for girls were due to this protected class statute. And so that means that about the other 36% were the other type of F2 that we typically see, which is assault using a deadly weapon. And so outside of that F2, we really only have two other options for charging an assault under the Pennsylvania Criminal Code. Um, and those are the F1 and the M2. And so there is a felony three assault, but it really does not apply to youth because it is typically used within correctional settings if you assault like a prison guard or something like that. So we're really not talking about F3 when we're charging youth because it is almost never applicable. 
um, when we are talking about is when these borderline cases that could kind of be a simple or an aggravated assault come into the office, it is going to be up to the discretion of those who are charging the assault to choose whether they are charging an F1 or an M2. And of course, these carry very different collateral consequences as youth proceed through the system. Um, and so any F1, this is one really important collateral co consequence of charging this type of assault. Any F1 automatically accrues 15 points on the city's detention screening. So when a, a youth is arrested and they're then screened using the risk assessment tool at the detention center, they will automatically accrue 15 points from an F1 charge. And that 15 points then recommends that they are held in secure detention pretrial. So as you can see, charging has a lot of collateral consequences, but this is an immediate one following arrest. And so because we saw that girls enter the system largely for assaults, they're gonna be disproportionately affected by this. So we also wanna talk about some other um, charging issues that we see in Pennsylvania that may affect this. So one of those is that there are no separate charging guidelines for youth and adults in Pennsylvania. And this is despite the fact that the Supreme Court has accepted that youth, due to their brain science, have a lower level of culpability than adults. And yet we are still going to be forced to charge underneath the criminal code, which applies to both youth and adults. And so we are basing youth charges off of the mens rea or the guilty mind of a reasonable adult, when we cannot expect a child to have the same mindset as a reasonable adult. And so some recommendations from this. We recommend that they are, we should craft adolescent-specific charging guidelines to differentiate between aggravated assault, simple assault, and summary of fighting offenses for youth. We also recommend that we should adopt adolescent-specific interpretations of mens rea culpability standards for all prosecutorial functions and policies in juvenile court. We should adjust the protected class statute mandating second-degree felony charges regardless of intent or injury. And we should increase the budget for preventative community supports that may help prevent behaviors, such as fighting, that may ultimately be interpreted as assaults. And so our third takeaway, moving on from assault and looking at specific places where some offenses might occur, we found that girls disproportionately enter the juvenile justice system for home-based and school-based offenses. And so first we're gonna take a look at the school-based incidents as a driver of girls' arrests. So we wanna take a look at the percentage of total youth arrests for a school-based incident. If we take a look at boys, about 11% of their arrests stemmed from a school-based incident. For girls, it was about double that. About 22% of all girls' arrests stemmed from a school-based incident. If we then look at some home-based incidents for boys, we're gonna see that about 8% of boys' arrests stemmed from a home-based incident compared to about 12% of girls' arrests. And so there are specific policies that might contribute to this. And we're gonna look at it from both a national policy lens, but then also how it shows up in our local data trends. And so starting with schools, the US Department of Education found that schools with police or resource officers had double the rate of law enforcement referrals for simple assault without a weapon. Um, and this is a crime for which girls are often accused. And this was compared to schools without school police or resource officers. And so knowing that girls are disproportionately entering the system for assaults and disproportionately entering the system for school-based offenses, this is especially concerning. So we took a closer look at our local data. And in Philadelphia in 2019, our records are showing that approximately 83% of girls' school-based arrests were for assault. And this was compared to only 55% of boys' school-based arrests. And so then looking at some home policies, um, this is actually related to domestic violence policing policies. And in 1984, the U.S. Attorney General's Office endorsed arrest as the preferred police response to domestic violence. And of course, this was a major win for um, survivors of intimate partner violence and advocates for this change, but it unfortunately disproportionately affected girls. And so one study found that domestic arrests um, disproportionately affected girls, especially for adolescent to parent violence. And that is actually one of the most likely scenarios to produce an arrest in all domestic cases, according to this study. And so in this same study, girls were most likely to be arrested for this adolescent to parent violence. And they were about two and a half times more likely to be arrested in domestic incidents than boys. 
And so when we look at our local data, we are seeing that girls for home-based incidents are often arrested for assault towards a parent or a guardian. So a lot of times it's a mother or a grandmother, and both nationally and locally, we're seeing that boys are arrested more for sibling to sibling um, fighting when it is a home-based incident. And so if we wanna take these together, we can see that for boys, if we take home and school-based arrests together, approximately one in five boys are arrested following a home or school-based incident. For girls, it's about one in three. So girls are disproportionately entering the system for assault and they are disproportionately entering the system for um, incidents stemming out of the home and school. And so some specific recommendations for this. We want to establish non-police-centered responses to reports of home-based disputes involving youth. We also want to distance police officers' proximity to school-based behavioral incidents, adjust the memorandum of understanding between the school district and police department to include a list of behaviors for which the police should never be called. We also want to continue the expansion of eligibility standards for the Philadelphia School Police Diversion Program, um, expanding past first-time minor um, offenses. We also want to improve the student-to-school counselor ratio. Currently, the Philadelphia School District uses a ratio of 650 to 1, whereas the American Society of Counselors actually recommends a ratio of 250 to 1. We also want to ensure gender-specific hiring practices so that girls feel comfortable going to their school counselor, and this can be used as both a preventative and a reactive um, recommendation for these issues. So I'm gonna pass it back to Adam now, and he's gonna discuss our final takeaway. All right, everyone, gonna try and get through this quick, because you all been sitting and looking at data for a while, wanna get everyone out to the breakout rooms. Um, our final kind of key takeaway, so we looked at where girls are being arrested, what they're being arrested for, now we're gonna talk about when they enter the system, how does the system assess them as being high risk or low risk for public safety or future criminality? And we found that despite girls demonstrated lower risk to public safety, they are often assessed at similar risk levels to boys, right? So what are we talking about when we talk about risk? This is a really important question to talk about with girls, right? Um, because there's some things that girls are high risk for that we assess them for that may not be in the purview of the juvenile justice system at all. So, if we're gonna look at some demonstrated behaviors, this is something that is not in any of these risk assessment tools, but something that's important to the city of Philadelphia right now. That's we looked at uh, the prevalence of gun-involved variables in our data set, right? And so percentage of total gun-involved arrests in 2019, 94% of those were of boys. So girls were not super likely to be arrested with a gun. This is probably our least precise uh, calculation. We were only able to know uh, of some youth who were shot after their entry into the system or were self-reported having been shot before, but of those that we knew, 96% of shooting victims of uh, youth were boys and not girls. And so when we talk about what we need to do for girls' safety sometimes, we wanna be clear that it is not necessarily their safety from getting shot or for public safety for carrying a firearm mostly. Uh, more on to kind of these criminogenic risk factors, which risk assessment tools are meant to predict, which would be, uh, you know, things that might predict somebody getting rearrested or uh, chronic delinquency. So we looked at um, the number of youth arrests of a youth who had a prior arrest when they entered the system. 48% of boys arrests had a prior arrest. 55% uh, of boys arrests were uh, of a youth who went on to be rearrested within three years. And about 27% of these arrests resulted in a kid failing to appear to court. And now if we look at girls, girls arrests were half as likely to be of a youth who had a prior arrest. Where uh, less than half as likely to see a girl go on and be rearrested within three years, and we're also significantly less likely uh, to see a girl fail to appear to court. Why are we showing these data uh, points? Because in the city of Philadelphia, we use two specific risk assessment tools. We're going to talk about those really quick. The first one, Kira had mentioned it, is called the Pennsylvania Detention Risk Assessment Instrument. This is uh, created by, um, it's an instrument created by Pennsylvania probation officers and other stakeholders. It is designed to measure it off the website risk to reoffend and or fail to appear at court. This is run immediately after a kid is arrested to determine if they should be held in secure detention to await their first hearing or uh, they should be released to their parents. The second risk assessment tool that we use in the city of Philadelphia is called the Youth Level of Service Case Management Index. This is purchased from a third party uh, service provider who uh, makes risk assessment tools. 
Their website says that this tool reliably and accurately classifies and predicts reoffending within male and female juvenile populations. Um, this is designed as a tool that is meant to be a case management tool for the probation department to determine what types of services and supervisions kids should receive. So when we look at these tools, we looked uh, in the last, um, we looked at the last slide at what the actual uh, risk was of girls for these factors. Now we're gonna look at the average risk assessment scores of boys and girls. So here are the average risk assessment scores of boys uh, on tools that are meant to predict the risk of rearrest and potentially the risk to fail to appear. And then here is the average risk assessment scores of girls on those same tools. So if we look at these things next to each other, the demonstrated risk of girls' likelihood to actually exhibit the behaviors that these tools are meant to predict are here. And here is the actual assessment for the risk of that behavior. So we do not see this type of separation in the tools, which we believe to mean that the tools are probably overclassifying girls' risk, right? So we start to look in the literature, and this is not something unique to Philadelphia. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of girls and risk assessment of juvenile offenders, which has this quote, feminist criminologist's primary critique of the risk principle upon which the YLS is built stems from evidence of overclassification, i.e. lower risk women routinely assessed as higher risk, resulting in unnecessary increased social control. So the important thing to note is these tools recommend supervision for children. So it doesn't not matter, right? These are directly tied to what services kids receive. So when we're talking about uh, one reason why girls may be overassessed, girls present to the system with a high series of needs that are unique to them. So research that we quote, our site says girls are more likely to have experienced sexual and or physical abuse, tend to have higher rates of home-based relational aggression, have experienced more parental and living situation transitions on average, these are of girls who enter the system, have more familial involvement in the criminal justice system, are more likely to be sexually exploited, and are more likely to be dual system involved in the child welfare and juvenile justice systems. So these are all very high needs. The question is, are our risk assessment tools confusing need with risk for future arrest, right? Um, now, the quick point, like when we look at our data, we're not saying here that girls have it worse than boys, right? A lot of the data will show uh, girls actually, um, like if we look at diversion here, right, it looks that girls are diverted at a greater rate. And that's true in the aggregate. The question we're gonna ask is given girls' own unique risks, are they still receiving way too much supervision? So boys' arrests in 2019, 14% were diverted versus 21% of girls were diverted. So that looks favorable to girls because you know maybe girls are lower risk, they're getting diverted at a higher rate. We then asked what happens to those girls who bypass diversion and go into the system. So this is the percent of non-diverted arrests mandated to court-ordered supervision. So we could see boys, about 79% of boys' arrests resulted in a youth being held in secure detention before their petition was ultimately discharged. There, 50% were put on in-home detention, 46% had a GPS ankle monitor, so this is a lot of supervision regardless of gender. About 22% resulted in out-of-home placement. And here's girls, so even though we showed data showing that about, uh, what do we say, about 23% of girls have prior arrests or went on to be rearrested, about 70% are held in secure detention of those arrests uh, when they proceed to the justice system. About 65% resulted in in-home detention, about 35% resulted in a girl being put on GPS, and about 16% resulted in a girl being placed in an out-of-home placement facility. We took a closer look at this. This out-of-home placement included what we knew to be dependent placements and delinquent placements, and about 53% of girls' arrests that resulted in a res residential placement commit saw a girl committed to a dependent placement facility compared to about 16% of boys' arrests that resulted in a placement commit. So what we see, those same home issues that are driving a lot of girls into the system, when we put girls on intensive supervision, maybe they're fighting at home, maybe something happens. A lot of girls are being removed from their homes, not put in delinquent facilities, but dependent facilities, which are where you go if you are at risk of neglect or abuse. So our recommendations from this, right, Again, we think that we need to implement gender responsive risk assessment strategies. If we know that boys and girls are presenting with much different risks, much different needs, and present, you know, many are being arrested for very different crimes, we probably should not use the identical tools to assess them. Uh, we believe we need to reduce the use of intensive supervision programs for everybody, including in-home attention and electronic monitoring. We believe that we need to assess supervision violations through a trauma-informed lens, considering use individual risk needs, with a particular emphasis on understanding and responding to girls' unique risk needs. And we think this one's really important. Again, what are we talking about when we talk about risk? We believe we need to decriminalize girls' romantic relationships, including court and probation responses to girls' sexual behaviors. 
So if we assess what somebody is high risk for, if that is not in the purview of the juvenile justice system, i.e. committing a crime, it probably should be handled in a system that is not uh, a court-based system, right? We can give supports to people who have needs to address their needs outside of a justice system. And so with that, we will open it up for a discussion for a few minutes. Uh, and I believe, yeah, five minutes. So, yep. I think we have the DA coming up along with Adam and Kira to answer questions. Sure. All right, so we are running a little behind and therefore we'll keep this section free so we can respect your time since we have breakout sessions coming. Um, are there any questions from anyone here or from the media? Representative Khan. Thanks, thanks, uh, DA Krasner. I just wanted to thank the district attorney's office and all the work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to say, uh, Adam and uh, Sarah and anyone from your team, if you'd be willing to put some bullet points of, of things that we can introduce in the state house to change it now that we have a majority in the, in the, uh, in the house, um, I will work with my colleagues to introduce those bills and maybe we can make some changes. But I just wanted to offer that 100% committed to that. Thanks. Thanks. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Yes, please. Hi, um, thank you for the invitation, first of all. I promise I stopped, it was 15 minutes late because I stopped outside to talk to the kids. Is there, and they have a really different view about what's going on up here. Is there any way that this information can be given to them because they really are out there, maybe I shouldn't, but out there thinking that this group is in here deciding what should happen for them, but nobody's talked to them, and that, you know, they were saying, fuck the judges. I said, we don't want to fuck all of us. <laughs> Great suggestion. A little background, though. The organization that organized that protest is funded through the Philadelphia DA's office. The organizers themselves were on the RSVP list, as were some of the kids. And I don't see them. So we are more than happy to have a separate we are meeting with them. Us are here. Okay. So well, good. So I'm glad you were. You got to hear what we presented. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, please. On that last slide, there was a bullet point about decriminalizing. So when we took a look at the national literature, we found um, such as, for example, a qualitative report of probation officers who viewed girls as being sexually promiscuous, lying about sexual abuse, so forth. And so while we can't exactly pull, we don't really have qualitative data for our local analysis, um, so we did have to turn to national literature for this. But within the national literature, we are seeing that stakeholders in the system are interpreting girls as being high risk due to consensual sexual behaviors and relationships and funneling them deeper into the justice system because they're portraying these as high risk um, rather than you know referring them out to counselors or sexual health resource centers and so forth to discuss these needs if they wish, because at the end of the day, they are not issues that should be handled by the criminal legal system, and so that is why it's in there. It will also be discussed further in the greater report. Thank you. Yeah. As a former service provider, too, there's a lot of kids, if they're you know, leaving the house with an older boy or something like that, are held in a facility potentially for their own safety and things like that. And so what are we talking about? Again, we talk about safety, and is that inside of the purview? Is secure detention? the best place to make somebody safe if that's what we're worried about. All right, we're getting close. Are there any other questions? Yes, please, in the back. How eager or supportive are providers in this study? How eager or supportive are providers for the study? Is that the question? Okay. Well, we have some in the room, so I don't want to speak for anybody. Um, and we've been working a lot, I guess, at least through diversion with some folks. Um, this is the first time that this has been released to uh, some of the court-based service providers, so I believe some of those folks are also in the room, so I don't want to speak for anybody. Uh, so um, if anybody else wants to speak up at any point in time, they can uh, represent that on, on their own. So we're just about to break out into the four different breakout groups, but I guess we have time for one more question. One more. Yes, please. Just uh, anybody chime in. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. I don't Hi. know if you can see me because of the light. I'm wondering if you can talk about any 
changes that the district attorney's office plans to implement in response to the recommendations. And I thank you again, Chair, and Madam Secretary. Uh, well, we certainly intend to consider changes, but we're not here to, to announce them today. Um, Jordan. Jordan, you want to speak to Jordan? <laughs> Jordan, would you, to not to put you on the spot if you don't want to, but Jordan has already started to implement some of this, so. Absolutely, just in response, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jordan Day, I'm the Director of Youth Diversion Programs. We've been pleased to our mechanisms to offer more growth in the system, diverse opportunities, free decisions out of the system. So, they're engaging in community-based alternatives um, instead of formal prosecution. Okay, so. Uh, I think it's time to announce the breakout groups. Yep. All right, so we're going to cut through all of the kind of rigmarole and just get right to it. Um, we called everyone here today. We asked for a challenge that said, what is our challenge? 